Hey survivors, this is the Apocalypse Post, your source for post-apocalypse events, documentaries, and general fandom, and I'm your host, Makeshift. Some of you may know a particular radiation crustacean, a poisoned gastropod, an incendiary slug known as the nuclear snail. Dimitri and his crew of mucus trailing mollusks have a YouTube channel where they give what could be the absolute best post-apocalyptic costume tutorials on the planet. Last year at Wasteland Weekend 18, Dimitri hosted an hour-long workshop in costuming, mainly focusing Cito. on taking costumes up to the next level. I'm just gonna let the whole thing roll because there's a lot of great information in there. Here comes Nuclear Snail right after you hit that subscribe button and the alert bell so you know every time I post a new video. And also, if you haven't checked out Nuclear Snail's channel, do it. Here we go. Hey everyone. So, as I said in the intro on Wednesday night, which seems so long ago now, that is um, <laughs> we are very excited that Dimitri from the Nuclear Snail Channel has joined us this year. Uh, That's me. We've been aware of him for a long time, following his work on YouTube. He has helped a lot of Wastelanders look their best, uh, and we've been talking about you coming out to this for years. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah. and so we're Finally, we're yeah. really. Really happy it was finally able to happen, thanks to the generosity of a lot of other Wastelanders as well uh, yeah. to help uh, cover his uh, plane ticket. So, I'm not going to waste any more time. He has a lot of cool things to tell you, and I'm sure you have a lot of things to ask him. And this is Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, do you guys hear me well when I speak yeah. like this? All right. PA systems are weird. Anyway, um... As announced, I'm gonna answer whatever you guys and girls have to ask, and I'm also gonna explain some costuming stuff using some examples. Volunteers, not so much volunteers. A um, couple of things uh, up ahead. The video is gonna be on my YouTube. It's being filmed right now, so if you don't wanna be there, don't show your face to the camera, don't talk, and so on and so forth. Uh, also, whatever I say from now on is for entertainment purposes only. I'm not responsible for any damages and whatsoever. So just don't follow my advice at all. <laughs> <laughs> so basically not responsible for any spilled soy milk. That said, I love soy milk. Does anyone have some? No? Okay. Anyway, um, other thing to be aware of, like, I am gonna be honest with all of you. So if you come up to get your custom critiqued, uh, I am gonna give a critique. I'm not going to diss you and make you feel bad, but I will say what I think about it and, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So if you're sensitive about things, just be aware of that. All of that said, uh, let's start by just asking if you guys have some questions first before I go on a long monologue talking about stuff. So, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> Anyone who has a question right now, just Hands up. Sure. C c come over here. W when you have questions and stuff, come here. Uh, thank you. Nice. Um, take the PA so everyone can hear. All right. So my wife and I are both aerial performers. Um, and for us, we've been having the challenge of we have to wear essentially like leotards, tight fitting clothes, and we have to figure out ways to distress and do appliques and accents that are not going to hang up on our apparatuses. So it's kind of a pro like a challenge to figure things out. We've done some grunge effect and like basically do paint on it to give like kind of some tribal symbols and things. But beyond that, do you have any other suggestions of pieces to apply to a basically a spandex base that are not going to get hung on bar? Uh, honestly, never work with spandex, but what you're doing seems about what, uh, like what I would do, uh, stencils, like you see here. So you can uh, work with graphic design a lot, so I would also advise uh, to not just make any sort of tribal, but to spend more time on the graphical design of that stuff. For example, if you see this logo right here, it doesn't look the part, but it took me a day. So uh, making a well-balanced graphic that communicates a lot is something that I would actually advise uh, to a lot of wastelanders I see which have uh, some decals painted onto their stuff. So this applies especially to you in that case because there is a limited amount of things you can do. As you yourself said, uh, probably if you like sew on a patch uh, onto your clothing, it will hang on the apparatuses because the seams are gonna catch themselves in the works. Is it the case? Um, it, it, depends on what, it depends on what part of the body it's on. So we have some like, some ability to applique, 
but then the rest of it has to be actually bonded to the spandex in a flat manner. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically uh, you know the areas better. I don't do aerial performing and it's badass. <laughs> so a huge compliment on anyone capable of doing that. Um, but uh, you know the areas which are safe, which are not safe. So uh, the things you're doing are actually exactly what I would do already. Just pay more attention to the graphical design. And also there is this sort of um, iron on um, transfer foil designs if you know what I mean yeah. you can also work with those because those bond directly with the fabric I don't know how it affects the stretchiness of it and how much of it you need it's okay if it breaks apart it looks more the part if it does yeah yeah so uh, you can work with those things but graphical design is your way to go okay. and it's not necessarily such a bad thing because uh, as an aerial performer you also are showing off your body you're really able-bodied people and it shows and it's uh, part of the show and by not overloading it with other stuff, uh, you actually focus more on that. Okay. So uh, if you look at my shirt, for example, there's also not a lot going on. Obviously, I have the rig above it, right. but other than that, it's this shirt. And if I just do more graphical design here on the shirt itself, uh, yeah, then it will look good. So uh, post it to my Facebook when you have it. I would love to okay. see it. Cool. Very yeah. good. We'll do. Thank you. All right. Um, that was the first question. Hey, Howard. Hey. What's up? Uh, okay, uh, more questions? Sure. Hey, how would you uh, compare the style from what you've seen in the wasteland with what you see in Europe, apart from the funny accents in Europe? Um, I would say that, uh, well, here it uh, might sound obvious, but it looks more American. <laughs> of course. Because we are in America. So if you wonder what those things are, it's especially the cars. Everything is huge, everything is way more modded than uh, what I had seen in Europe. And a lot more things are street legal than it would be in Europe. <laughs> and that's cool. And sometimes terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, especially the cars. But also I see a lot of, uh, for example, um, if you look at that gentleman, like football, shoulder pads. I see that a lot here, a lot more than uh, somewhere else. Or if you look at Mike with his hat, uh, like those typical uh, cowboy hats, you also see a lot uh, more of those here. Um, also because it's hot would be my take, I also have mine. I'm just not wearing it as a part of the, the costume. Um, other than that, um, that's about it. It's okay. more American. Okay, okay. thanks, Cheers. Sure. Next question. Anyone? Sure. Nice camera, by the way. Yeah, thank you. That's kind of what I want to talk to you about. Um, can you grunge this up? What do you do? You're a photographer. Uh, yeah. Uh, what I do is about my camera distressing is excessively not giving a fuck. $4,000 camera. <laughs> exactly. That's a $4,000 camera and you don't want to fuck with that. That said, if you do want to fuck with that, that just take some paints. Like something that will not get inside of it, be very careful. And, um, or, or do this, yeah? That also works. Obviously could distress the fabric a bit more, but you know, just hiding it a bit helps. Or, I just bought this dust cover, so I'm gonna try to distress this. What are your thoughts on painting on this? Uh, yeah, just use some paints that won't actually destroy it. So um, it's pretty much what I did with my pants. So you don't see any structural damage. I did no belt sander or something on it. All I did was some uh, fabric paints and uh, basically the whole thing is structurally intact because I want to be running around with them without getting a large hole on my crotch. Like a, each wastelander who wears pants does the first time. You get some cheap pants, you distress them, you get some holes, you s do some pose for an epic photo and then there goes the crotch. Anyway. Um, don't fuck with the structure, just do some uh, basic paint, stay away from areas like the screen and the buttons. And honestly, I would advise you to just not worry about it. Because, uh, I mean, I get it, if you're a photographer, professional, or just really uh, passionate hobbyist or whatever, then you uh, will want your gun to be distressed as well, I get that. Right. But, uh, you know, it's, it's different, it's a $4,000 camera, while that is a $25 airsoft rifle. So, I don't know man, just get a gun, distress it, run around with that, okay. and don't mess with this. But if you do, just some paint. 
and don't do the dust thing I've shown on in my videos like you don't want any dust in there just be extremely careful and uh, I would advise going acrylic if you do it at all really? yeah okay. be because acrylic is water-based and uh, uh, has less capacity of messing with uh, stuff all right okay thank you sir thank you okay um, more questions you were just talking about the, uh, the pants issue and uh, um, what would you do? <laughs> what would you suggest? Uh, show it to me again. Oh, Yo, you, you want another look? I would suggest uh, glute bridges and front squats. <laughs> Thank you. That was good. Wait, wait, wait. You, you need to catch this on camera. No, no step on snake. <laughs> no step on snake! Where, where can I get one? Uh, Amazon. <laughs> nice, thank you. Cool. All right. Yeah, they sell awesome. flags. They sell flags and they do patches. I have a flag in my camp. It's worth it. Okay. I want one. Yeah. Anyway, uh, to answer it seriously, you're one of those wastelanders with the pants. Do you see his crotch and uh, like his butt? <laughs> yeah, show it. Show the goods. Ooh. Ooh, where that booty at? Wood. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> anyway, um, you can uh, sew it up. You can patch it up with uh, actual patches, like not not like this, but like or maybe like this. Uh, just a piece of fabric that goes on top. Just uh, treat it the way you your grandmother would, if you would come to her and would be like, "Grandma, my pants are torn." She would just stitch them up. That's what you do. That's what people in the Middle Ages did as well, because they were poor. Uh, the same would happen in the apocalypse. It's fine. Uh, the only issue with that, especially on the butt, it will tear again and again and again i had a uh, pair of pants which i loved really much and they were great and they were one of those 20 30 dollar pants from uh, the internet and um, over time they uh, got more and more post-apocalyptic up until the point where they got so post-apocalyptic it wasn't possible to wear them anymore at which point they landed in my mixed fabrics box for you know just pieces would you I was thinking about getting a staple gun and stapling the fabric. Have you ever done that? Not, not into myself. I will, the pants won't be on. Uh, yeah, fuck no. Okay, don't do that. You, uh, that will just, they will just open. Uh, especially, they will open. They will open when you play jugger, when you do some cool poses, when you accidentally bump into someone while fighting, drinking. I don't know what, doing what. And uh, once that sharp piece of metal opens, in your sensitive areas. You're gonna have a good time. <laughs> I, I'm not king shaming, but uh, you know, <laughs> just beware that it's gonna be fun. Okay. So basically, um, common sense, sharp metal stuff plus crotch area. Fuck no. I, unless you know, still not king shaming. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. So I'm a new I'm a new wastelander. This is my first year. Woo! Uh, I don't believe it, it is my first year too. Right? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so when uh, I did the rent fair stuff, so when the friends asked me to uh, about Wasteland, I was like, uh, contemplating. I'm a retired Marine. So uh, You're a retired Marine. I'm a retired Marine. Well fuck yeah! yeah. <laughs> so 27, Dude. 27 years. It's a retired Marine! Yeah. Fuck yeah! Thank you. Thank you. So I put all my shit away. <laughs> okay. And I was glad I didn't have to touch it. Yeah, you know, I was. I, you yeah, mean I your uh, military gear? Yeah. Okay. So I wore it for a uh, profession, and then I put the shit away, and I was glad I didn't have to touch it again because the shit's heavy and it's hot. Yeah. But when I saw your videos, uh, I just went to YouTube, not knowing who the hell you were. Uh, you were the first videos. I said, you know, this is a guy that I need to follow. Thank you. So I just started watching your videos. It, it, it's kind of it kind of a little crazy because you know at night you know I'm supposed to be going to bed, but I got the iPad in front of me going through all your videos. So let's get to the question because I, I know there's probably others. So I'll, I'll show you what I did. Uh, I have it here. I'll probably wear it a little later. I'll show you my military, where I wore military, and then what I had made. <laughs> you should have brought it, mate. Can you zoom in I, on I, that? Yeah. So. Oh yeah, that is actually pretty cool. So this is, you know, that that was real. Yeah. That was heavy as shit. That's like 90 pounds, and then that was my vision based off of 
country. Cool. Uh, let's see if we can get this into the camera. So what I did is I, I took uh, my military shit. Um, the, the one thing that I, I found myself when you different um, compared to your styles, you know, looking at the different styles is I wanted to maintain desert. Yeah. Because that's, that's where most of my profession was. That's mm -hmm. where, uh, a lot of years of the European is a lot of green because of, you know, that's the environment. So for me, I wanted to stay desert looking. And you do. That, and, as far as I can see, it would have been really better to see it live because it actually looks awesome. You guys unfortunately cannot see it, but I'll, it looks when, uh, pretty after badass. After dinner, I'll, I'll put it on. I'm going to wear it today. Yeah, just come by tomorrow again wearing it. Uh, 1330 okay. is going to be the workshop again, so that is actually really worth uh, seeing. It's good. It's good, and it I looks desert that. as fuck, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, because your videos <laughs> kept me awake at night, uh, all, the, all the details, and I tried. These were my first examples trying the, the you know, the, the brown paint with the dirt yeah. and then trying the black paint with the dirt. And then I, I felt like, okay, I'm trapping, I'm not able to breathe because mm. it's so thick. Yeah, you can overdo on paint. That's yes, true. yes. So it, what, what was the question? The question is, um, can we see, can we see you doing some distressing uh, desert style? Uh, yeah, uh, that is actually really simple. You already saw that. Uh, the only difference is the colors of the stuff I would take. That is the only difference. All the techniques um, are exactly the same ones. You smear, paint, you uh, um, spray and dust, all of that. Uh, also, um, whatever f uh, base fabric you choose, like the base tone, that is probably going to show through. So, if I wanted this to be more desert-like, I would just start not with olive pants, but with uh, coyote pants. So, it's just colors. Just colors. Yeah, just colors. yeah. That's uh, all there is to it. So, what do we need to do? The second question. So, what do we need to do to contract you to to do a piece? Uh, hit me up on Facebook. On Facebook. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. All right. <laughs> Questions. Yeah. What's up, Sheriff? <laughs> Not much. Anyways, um, so my question is this. Is there a point when you're making a costume where there's too much details? Fuck yeah. Yeah? At uh, what point would you say is that? Um, okay, so detail and when is it too much of it? Whew. Uh, it is a thing. Um, it is not as straightforward as, as some might think. The thing with detail is that you can make amazing costumes with a lot of detail as long as you can put that detail in, in a controlled way. Okay. In such a way that is controlled to a degree which is sufficient to make it look not like complete clusterfuck. It is kind of similar like weight training and the amount of weight you can lift. So when you, when you squat, I don't know, uh, 50 pounds and your form is perfect, that is a lot better than to squat 350 pounds while breaking your spine. So it's the <laughs> same thing with detail. Uh, you should put as, in as much detail as A, you feel like. Some costumes are supposed to be more detailed, some less detailed. This one is, for example, a lighter version that I'm wearing right now. I have uh, pieces that are a lot more detailed. Um, and be as much detail as you can handle, basically. So once you start noticing that your costume is kind of turning into a clusterfuck of everything that starts kind of looking like nothing, that's the point where you know, okay, I can't handle this much detail. And what you do then is you go uh, through all of the layers, all the detailing layers of yeah. your costume, and see how you can arrange them in a more orderly fashion so that it uh, kind of makes sense, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think I got you. Okay, uh, does everyone get what I mean by that? All right. Or does anyone not get it? Hands up. Okay, everyone gets it. Great. Then I will see all of you next time with a large amount of detail. <laughs> all sorted nicely. Okay, uh, more questions? No, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Next, next, 
next. Yeah, come on out. Ah. Nice umbrella, by the way. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, first of all, I just want to thank you for coming all the way out from Europe for doing this. Like everything me and my wife learned about post apocalyptic costumes because of your channel. Thank you. So, thank you. I just got to get that out of the way first. So one thing I'm wondering about is, uh, since you've been doing this for many years now, I'm wondering where do you draw, when you're concepting new designs, where do you draw your inspiration? Maybe where are some of the more unusual places that you draw inspiration for when you're concepting new designs? Um, that is gonna be a tough one. <laughs> Man, I'm gonna just lay back like this. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Anyway, um, let me just fix this. It feels kind of weird on the head. The thing about inspiration is that it mostly works in subconscious ways. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, so, I'm originally from Russia. I was born in Russia. And thanks God we immigrated to Germany when I was 16. But I still have a grandma in Russia. So my father and I uh, went to visit her in 2012 at the same time. My father lives in Canada, Vancouver. So we came to Russia at the same time after not seeing each other for 12 years. I hadn't seen my father for 12 years. And um, then we took a picture together in front of the house. And when I looked at the picture, I was like, holy shit, we look almost identical in our, not just in our faces, but our clothing style. It was like a, a pair of cargo pants, a belt, shirt tucked into the pants, and a parka jacket. I was like, what the fuck? And then I realized that the reason why I liked that kind of clothes for all this time was because I saw my father a lot wearing those as I was a kid. So stuff works in subconscious ways. So whatever it is you find uh, interesting is gonna most likely have been seen by you in your childhood, in your adulthood, in your teenage years, or maybe even recently, and then your brain somehow processes that um, information out and makes you like certain things yeah. and not like other things and so on and so forth. So um, you draw inspiration just from uh, what is called a visual library. Uh, does anyone of you know Feng Zhu, the concept artist? Okay, uh, it's a famous concept artist and he talks about the concept of the visual library. Basically all of the stuff you see, it gets saved into your brain and then uh, your brain has the access to that information subconsciously when you design something. So if you're a person who has seen a lot of stuff, a lot of cool stuff, then you will be able to come up with a lot of cool stuff. If you're a newborn who has been held in a dark room for his entire life, then you probably have bigger problems than making art. But <laughs> then you will also not have a large uh, visual library you will not have seen a lot of stuff, you will not have seen a lot of art, because all of this really goes back to the point in history where the first caveman drew the first buffalo onto the wall, and art developed since then, mm -hmm. and all of that accumulates into what we see today in modern artworks, such as all of your costumes, such as modern movies, modern pictures, modern everything, so all of that accumulated into this stuff which you nowadays have the luxury to see when you're a kid. You get some cool comics, you see some cool films, all that gets saved. So to get back to your question and answer it now in a more yeah. straightforward way uh, after this intro, I basically draw my inspiration from my visual library. Mm -hmm. And obviously sometimes when I see a recent cool movie or uh, read a book, a comic, whatever, then I will also be more inclined to doing that sort of stuff. Like, if I see something with pirates, I might consider making a costume which kind of looks like a pirate costume, you know? Yeah. So, uh, it's as simple as that. So, uh, for... Uh, like, I, I get this question a lot, actually. <clears throat> Sorry. Like, where do you get inspiration? Uh, and uh, the answer is, if you're having trouble getting inspiration, you know, there is this thing called the Internet. There is this thing called internet legal online streaming services where you can watch movies and you can play computer games and you can look for pictures. Uh, basically just consume more art to be able to produce more art. Simple as that. And if you're spontaneously just looking for a uh, inspiration for a Raider costume, don't ask me, just ask the internet. 
just punch in post-apocalyptic raider costume, you will have one million different concept arts, and that's pretty much it. But to just have a large visual library constantly consume art as a uh, as the recipient of the art. Yes, please. I'm going to take Thank two you, questions. Appreciate it. Yeah. So going on that artistic concept thought process, so I would like you to talk a little bit about when I first started wasteland and costuming, I came from a military background, had been outdoors my whole life. So I tried to approach it from a more practical, it's an infantry unit and I'm like, okay, what would I carry on my back? What would be worth it to me to carry in a post-apocalyptic setting? And I'd like you to talk a little bit about breaking the mindset of practicality into the mindset of visual aesthetic and combining the two. Yeah, that's my favorite. Okay. Yeah, that's actually what I kind of did with this costume that I'm wearing right now. Uh, and it is actually my favorite topic. Uh, as I develop myself, I have... Um, set as one of my goals to make my stuff not only better looking but also more practical at the same time because at the start um, as every one of us at least the ones that want to be uh, looking like a big manly raider and all that <coughs> mike kemling <coughs> mike <coughs> kemling <coughs> or me at the start of my uh, costuming career uh, we always make the mistake of making something super big, super heavy, something that will just suffocate the fuck out of us, and that is basically a death sentence. So, um, after you wear that stuff for a couple of times, you start realizing that, hey, maybe all those Hollywood movies lied to you, and um, wearing stuff that's super huge and super heavy on your back will break your back. and. You will be hot, you will be miserable. And there is a reason why acting is a job that is super tough. So those people are not doing it just for fun with those costumes. Um, we are doing it for fun because we're crazy, but anyway. So, um, practicality and looking cool are actually at weird odds with each other. On the one hand, looking cool is partially to a large extent, actually, to a very large extent, de uh, devised from what uh, would be actually practical. Because think about it, uh, if you have um, an armor, which looks cool, come here please, just as an example of an armor. So to put it in really simple terms, him having an armor versus not having an armor make him, makes him look cooler. And this is actually a nice, really nice distressing job right there. Yeah, so um, practicality is kind of uh, part of cool looks to a certain extent. But first let's analyze why it is the case. Why is uh, coolness or cool looks part of, uh, or why is practicality part of cool looks, sorry. Because generally as biological beings we are wired for this primitive thing of survival of the fittest. So when we see someone who is in some sort of way fit, doesn't necessarily mean strong, but that can be part of being fit, or armored in this case, we perceive it as something cool. So in this wasteland setting where you have raiders roaming around and feral beasts and mutants and whatnot attacking you, obviously wearing something that protects you makes you more fit to survive. Does this not make sense to anyone? This makes total sense. So this makes him look cooler as running around with a t-shirt. It also makes him cooler uh, than running around with a t-shirt for other reasons, such as this actually being a costume and just running around with a t-shirt being lame. But it also <laughs> makes him cooler because it makes him more fit to survive. So it, it goes to a certain extent. It's the foundation. And uh, the mistake a lot of people make is that they go all the way just with that theme. So, Mr. Former Practical Man, right here, what's your name again? Uh, Jimmy. Jimmy. So, Jimmy right here, who used to be a super practical guy and also having a real military background, would then probably just take military clothes and be like, yeah, okay, this is practical. This is what the modern warrior does. The problem here is that while what we do here uh, is to a large extent, I'll call it realistic, or at least way more realistic than, say, foam cosplay. 
you still have to keep in mind that you're doing this for a fantasy event. And by fantasy, I don't mean dragons. By fantasy, I mean just it's fantasized. This post-apocalyptic stuff is not real. And thanks God it's not. We can all meet here and pretend it is and make some cool artistic costumes and get drunk and high and all that instead of being dead, which would happen in a realistic apocalypse. Whenever someone comes up with this, uh, yeah, but this would be realistic if we did this, this and that. I, I, I'm always saying, you know what? A realistic post-apocalyptic uh, post situation, realistic war, it, it's horrible. You don't want to do that. Like, why would anyone want to do that? So, um... What's up? <laughs> So you have to realize that uh, you are making an artistic costume, you are making an artwork for a certain setting. So you have to stop thinking completely realistically and ask yourself um, what would be authentic. I'll repeat this again. Stop thinking about realism as, and start thinking about authent uh, authent authenticity. <laughs> yes, <laughs> authenticity. <laughs> The difference is realism is is authenticity authenticity <laughs> authenticity to our existing real world but a costume and artwork and anything can also be authentic to a fantasy world now how far this fantasy world is away from our real world is a different question altogether it can be as realistic as a zombie apocalypse where everything is exactly the same but one point which is zombies happened everything else is the same that is really close that is a really realistic setting but still the zombies happened you know so it's not our exact world you would do things differently uh, now wasteland weekend hundreds of years after the apocalypse that's super fantasy <laughs> that, that is really super fantasy and you have to keep this in mind now um, the main thing is to realize that you are making in fact a costume for this setting and once you go with this setting you can be as realistic as needed you will just get a feeling for it I'll talk a bit about my own costume here because that as I've said it's something that I've did um, to look um, setting appropriate but comfortable at the same time so what I did here is actually a costume that I found in a bunker you can see a decal right here from bunker epsilon thanks by the way to Fujio for the authentic Japanese font I actually had him uh, select a font which looks not stupid and cartoonish to actual Japanese people so that it is actually authentic. So I care about authenticity. Now, is there an English slash Japanese bunker anywhere in the world, really? I don't know, I don't care. I'm not making it for the real world, I'm making it for Wasteland. So it's authentic to this world. It, it is something that could happen like this, you know, a guy from a bunker which is bilingual for whatever reason because it's all in the future and who knows what kind of alliances and stuff develop politically before the apocalypse, blah, 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 blah. You don't have to explain all of those things in your costume. It's sufficient if you just uh, touch up on them and that creates a story. That's actually a, a different, very important aspect that your costume tells a story and it's kind of connected. All of this stuff is connected, really. I could talk for five hours about all of this stuff that is connected and by the end of it, you would be like, Okay, let's smoke some weed now. Holy <laughs> shit. Um, but anyway, continuing with the realism aspect. Uh, I also have just thought about what would be authentic. So let's just replace realism with authenticity to the genre. So I was like, okay, I'm going to be a bunker boy. And since I'm going to be a bunker boy, what kind of, a, uh, um, what kind of clothes could a bunker boy wear? while keeping in mind that I wanted to be real-world practical, not to die on Wasteland Weekend. So it was like, I'm not wearing an armor, like, nope. Now we brought out those Ragnarok shells, those really thick armors from uh, resin that, that also weigh a lot, and uh, my friend Elliot was like, are we gonna be wearing that? I'm like, motherfucker, no! <laughs> you can wear that. I actually uh, brought a metal armor for him, he's gonna have fun. Um, so I wanted to have something that has a shirt as a base to put it short. And I also wanted my good military pants here, so I've just, you know, I just gave them a uh, paint job and that's the base. And on top of that, I obviously need to carry my stuff, so here's a hip bag and another hip bag. That is purely practical, actually. I just uh, gave some decorations to those. 
And um, yeah, this plate right here, for example, I, I was thinking about what kind of a um, what decal could go on a uh, hip bag like this in a futuristic bunker. And I came up with something like this. So those numbers and stuff don't mean anything. It's just, you know, random stuff. But it makes it look a bit more sci-fi. Would they make it uh, like this on a real military uh, bag? Hell no. Or probably not. But it's authentic to the genre because there is uh, this, again, authenticity instead of realism. There is a certain and an actually really high suspension of disbelief. Because, you know, post-apocalypse. Fantasy. Like in the real apocalypse, everyone would need to carry around a huge shopping cart full of water and food and whatnot. And not many of us would survive a day, honestly. Uh, also, what they don't show in the movies and stuff, uh, also not in the recent post-apocalyptic and zombie series. They usually will show the zombie survivor with, uh, running around like me. Like, a uh, former military man can tell you what an assault pack like this is sufficient for. For how much time is this sufficient? Not even a day in this environment. Not even day, a day in this environment. In every computer game, in every movie, you will run around like this. Or will, with just your nipples covered with armor and nothing else. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I can't stress this enough. Keep, just keep in mind you're doing something for a fantasy setting. Even if this fantasy setting doesn't look like dragons, it's still fantasy. So, uh, going on with the backpack and stuff, uh, I was thinking about uh, what kind of systems could a more futuristic thing get. So if you see that pulsar thing uh, over there, I thought it would be like, uh, maybe something like an EMP shockwave device that it's actually connected with a cable to this little button right here and it goes all the way back to the pulsar so it could be either a distress beacon or it could be like an EMP device that is triggered by this so just some sci-fi futuristic-ish stuff as you see I'm not giving too much thought to what it could be it just has to make some sort of a sense you look at it and you go like okay there is a device there is a decal on it saying pulsar so it might be sending a pulse what kind of a pulse? I don't know, but it's triggered by this button because it's connected to it, so that's it. So I don't know if they would make it again in a real military situation. Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know, some sort of a long-range distress beacon. I've been out for over 12 years, so I have no idea what is the current issue of things. But that, but that is something that could actually happen. Yeah, we used IRs. We used to use infrared beacons for things, yeah. but I don't know with you know the how good Wi-Fi and everything is now. I don't know if we use those now, but it's completely possible. I mean. Why have an IR when you could have something non-visible? Exactly. So, um, soon. Uh, that is the thing with coming up with cool details that are realistic, but at the same time uh, cool. Um, the way I made this look, and the way anyone knowing their craft would make this look, is more obvious, more cool, more flashy. Because, honestly, like if you look at it again, why would you have your pulsar out there? Okay, maybe you need to get it there because it's mounted on your back right before the mission, but that's also like super dramatic movie stuff. Usually you would have it inside of your backpack where the enemy cannot see it and can snipe you in the device, and then you can't contact the base. But here I'm wearing it out openly because it looks cool. Because otherwise, how would I tell the story? Because costumes uh, are exactly what I just said. It's stories. You're telling stories with your costume. Instead of writing it, Instead of um, singing it in a song, you're telling it with your costume. And uh, those stories need to make some sort of sense to be not completely fucking stupid, but they also cannot be documentaries. Like, all, all the guys running around in modern day fatigues on a wasteland event are doing a documentary about the army instead of doing a film about futuristic post-apocalyptic warriors. So it needs to have both. On that, I, I had an art instructor in high school that said, whatever you're doing, whether it's painting, performing, sculpting, anything, you're making a lie that tells the truth. Yes. He was a wise man. <laughs> Rule of cool. OK, Kai, you had a question. No, I was just going to say, rule of cool. Oh, yeah. 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 The rule of cool also applies. So uh, I've actually talked a lot about this in one of my recent videos or maybe not so recent, I, I definitely talked about this on the channel, so um, scavenge through that and uh, check out that video, I think it was 
it was actually called the uh, realism or the role of realism for post-apocalyptic costumes and there I talk exactly about this kind of stuff so um, is this point clear by now or does anyone want more information about this aspect we can listen to you talk all day <laughs> so I really enjoyed all your uh, art kind of theory videos you put up about composition. Thank you, that's a wise man. And, uh, this guy knows that theory is more important for making a good costume than road killing your fucking jacket. And I was just curious, this is more of a personal question, but do you have a fine arts background? Uh, uh, yeah, I've uh, studied photography and photo compositing uh, at an art college. So I know how to make uh, very, very, very highly engineered and complicated pictures with Photoshop. I know how to set lights. I've studied this kind of stuff. So movie posters, uh, advertisements, all that kind of stuff. Uh, also 3D. So I just uh, have graphic design okay. studies and photographer studies behind me. And what I actually did at the start of Nuclear Snail is put those uh, design principles those applied art principles to work on my costumes and that's when the costumes actually get good my first costumes weren't good they were like okay what do I have in my wardrobe okay I'm putting this on okay it looks kind of like a raider I look like a guy with a tank top um, not even dirty but I was like okay fuck it good enough and uh, after that it was like huh, what if I applied my knowledge of um, other art stuff such as making pictures to this because um, it's kind of like martial arts. If you know boxing, you will have a lot easier time doing Muay Thai as compared to someone who doesn't know anything and has no conditioning and whatsoever. So art is all connected. So someone who knows how to make good pictures is way more likely to make a good costume and the other way around. So yeah, um, that's why I always recommend, um, you know, checking out all of those applied art theory things like all of the videos on my channel uh, that uh, have the least amount of views because the titles sound boring, check those out, then you will get good. I understand it's fun to watch me crawl around in a leather jacket, but that's absolutely not what makes me special or good or whatever. It's the theory stuff, because I understand how to make a good composition. And that is something you can learn. That's absolutely learnable. It, it will take time like any skill, but yeah, learn that. Okay, questions? So, how could one do better their storytelling without misconstruing the original concept of the art uh, for those who are more color oriented? Say again? <laughs> I see you're color more color oriented, but um, how, how could I? better my storytelling with my costume without misconstruing the original concept. Um, I got that part, but the one with the color? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think you're kind of asking if it's okay to be colorful in Wasteland. Yeah, fuck yeah. Or, uh, sort of like, with, without someone thinking something different of your costume, like being able to read better your, your, co your concept, if that makes sense. Yeah not entirely so i see like five questions in what you just asked so i'll just uh, try to answer all okay so um just uh, try to make it more personal actually so what was your struggle in this particular regard um last year a lot of people thought i looked like the joker and i was trying not to make that happen and I was trying to portray someone that uh, had the Alice in Wonderland book as their Bible. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. So uh, the th here is the a really mean thing. If someone already made the Joker or some other character look a certain way, if you look kind of similar, people are always going to reference, the, reference that more famous thing. That is just going to freaking happen. That is just going to happen. Um, what you can do is just uh, you ha have to find your own interpretation of something. I mean, I didn't see that yet. Like the way you look right now, I wouldn't see. I wouldn't say I saw this on some other character in a comic or in a book. So it is more unique than what you did last year, I assume. So that's already a success. So good for you. As for uh, being colorful in the wasteland, that's obviously cool. 
that's obviously okay. Everything is okay. And it is also obviously something that is, uh, that's going to be more outstanding than the rest. You're going to be more uh, noticeable out of a crowd, which you are right now. That's cool. Um, because there is no rule that says that Wasteland has to look like this or like this or like this or like any typical brownish, greenish, military, mercenary guy. There is no such rule. You can make whatever kind of costume you want. Um, as for staying within your concept, um, my concepts change a lot while I work. So it, it is actually part of uh, the larger thing, like the connection or the relationship between you and your costume. I will get into that. But my concepts um, change a lot and I don't go in with a really fixed concept. Like, I want to do exactly this. I don't have like all the sketches out. I, I can draw. I'm, usually I'm just like, okay, I want something light and I'll just start. So on this costume, I wanted a, uh, some hydration pack on my back. I wanted it to be a thick harness, which emphasizes my upper body to make me look more buff. <laughs> and I wanted it to be uh, looking like a bunker boy. Those were the three criteria, and those are really vague, as you can see. It doesn't say what, what exact shape, what exact color does my backpack have. I didn't even think of that. So well, when you design a character like this, uh, what I hope you did, or what I hope you will do in the future is think, okay, I want to do something colorful. I want to do something inspired by whatever it is you're inspired by, uh, Alice in Wonderland in this case. And I want something that is, for example, comfortable at the same time, or makes me look buff, or makes me look slim, or makes me look whatever. So just get a bunch of vague criteria which you want your custom to fulfill, and then go from there. Uh, that's at least how I do it. Uh, there is nothing wrong with sketching everything out super precisely and going with that. I just find it a lot more stressful. And when it's uh, not necessary, then it's not necessary. If I get a concept art from like a movie studios or whatever, and they want it exactly like this, I can do that. But usually, uh, even for professional clients, I, I tell them, you know, you know what? Just give me the vague stuff. I'll do the rest. I can do it better than if you give me like an exact concept art, because then I can't live out my creativity. So uh, I'm not sure it answers your question exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, yes, uh, I will do one more and then I will go into the aspects of relationship of you and your costume uh, and everyone else in their costume because that is something that plays a lot of wastelanders coming out. <laughs> All right, this is a troublemaker question. This is a sensitive subject amongst wastelanders. How do you feel about blue denim? It can, it can be used, same as uh, camo pattern, same as fucking everything, but you have to use it carefully. Um, the thing is that there are those storytelling things, like those, um, what is it called? Dramatic devices, those archetypes which will tell the wrong story and that wrong story can be i went to the freaking thrift store i didn't have a lot of time and here is my wasteland costume just leave me alone that's not a story you want to tell that's lazy storytelling um that said you can work with uh, denim you can work with camo fabric you can work with everything but there are just those dead giveaway things that uh, say hey this is a costume this is a costume this is not real this is not immersive and especially for beginners you really don't want to take a uh, blue denim or camo pattern if you're a beginner because uh, guys and girls who are better can work with those things. They know their way around distressing, around everything. But if you're just starting out, just stay away from that until you learn more. Because regardless of how realistic it would be, regardless of how comfortable it is, there are just those certain archetypes. It's, it's similar to what I said before, like with a colored guy. Where is he? Anyway. As I said before, um, if someone has already made something, established an archetype of something, and that archetype is in people's heads, it's hard to get around it. You know, there are certain things in the authentic medieval clothing. You look at that and you go like, that's authentic medieval, that looks modern. Uh, like, uh, for example, uh, Shemak scarves. If you take a Shemak scarf nowadays, 
if I would wrap uh, one around my head, you would rather think uh, something like U.S. soldiers in Iraq or something like that, rather than historical Arabic something something, because uh, the archetypes just work in that kind of way. You've seen it a lot in recent times, you associate it with something more modern. So when we go to uh, Fantasy LARP with my girlfriend, we do not take uh, any Shemax just for the reason that it will look like uh, either a modern soldier or a modern punk. Because a lot of different kinds of people wear the Shemax because it's just comfortable. Uh, and since it's so comfortable, you see it a lot. Whether you're uh, alternative, like into punk music or metal, you will see people with Shemax. Whether you're uh, into guns and stuff, you will see uh, all the soldiers wearing those. And you just don't think the Shemak is a historical piece of clothing, although it is. It's a couple of thousand years old, I think. I'm not a historian, but that's one of those archetypes. Now, blue jeans and stuff uh, and camo pattern are among those things that all the beginners will take because they are just existing in the real world. Now, it's even not a question, again, coming back to the realism topic, it's not even a question of whether or not uh, there would be some... Uh, realistic application of those uh, fabrics and clothes there certainly would be if the apocalypse would really happen then yes a lot of people would, ha would have military clothing and uh, denim but uh, for something that is supposed to represent a world that's a bit different from ours which is what we're striving to achieve here those things just take it out of um, immersion they're immersion breakers that is what happened but, yes, as I've said, you can work with those things if you know how. But that's an entirely different topic. You have to distress a lot, you have to combine it with other things that are not exactly um, everyday. Um, again, I have some decent example on me right now. You just see a shirt, but I've applied some effects to a shirt which you otherwise would not see. There is a story in the graphics. There is a story on the other shoulder in the graphics too. There is some story going on here. And most importantly, if I would take this off and you would just look at the shirt without reading what, what it says in the graphics, it would look more like a zombie survivor than someone from a more high fantasy setting in which the apocalypse happened, there are bunkers, there are raiders. It wouldn't look like that. It would look like a guy in a shirt. But since I'm combining it with a pack which looks more apocalyptic, sci-fi, whatever, it's a combination which redeems the basic shirt. So you can do the same with basic pants, yes. But, you know, just for beginners, stay away from that stuff and come back to it later once you know what you're doing. Does this answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. All right, yes. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Snail. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank okay, um, more questions? Okay, if not, then I'm going to talk about your costume and you. Okay, so I got uh, a question about generally receiving criticism from this beautiful lady over here, over the internet, before the event even started. And yeah, just could you voice your question again, please? Uh, it's not much question, I just want to know if I'm doing it right. Always doing You're it. doing it right, yeah. <laughs> so what, what you wrote to me back on Facebook was, however, uh, I have a problem with receiving criticism about I my costume. A lot, a lot of anxiety about receiving criticism about the costume. So that is something I really want to talk about because a lot of people have that. And it's answered in a really simple fashion. Uh, you are not identical with your costume. Your costume is just your artwork. It's just like a picture you paint. And yes, we do put a lot of effort and heart and personality into our costumes, which is why it can hurt when someone criticizes it. Now, the important thing is to differentiate between uh, constructive criticism and someone just dissing you. So the latter you just ignore. And I don't think there is a lot of wastelanders that will go like, ah, fuck you, this is shit. And I, I never met a wastelander like this. And if they are around, they don't last for long. Now, constructive criticism is something that is indeed constructive. That is when I would tell you, okay, I see what you're trying to do here. Important part for constructive criticism is that the person giving it understands what are you, you're trying to achieve. So there is a difference between someone just saying it, uh, saying, okay, uh, I don't like your style. It's just taste. It is also not an offense to you. If someone doesn't like the Bunker Boy style that I'm wearing right here, I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. I also have other costumes, and even if I don't, it's their personal taste. So that is not even a criticism. 
criticism is when you when someone uh, goes ahead and actually takes their time and cares about your costume and says, "Hey, Mike, I really like your jacket, and I love the composition, but like that shotgun shell right there, it could be like a bit more up or whatever, and then it makes it better, you know." Not that the shotgun shell was really bad or anything, I'm just giving an example. So, when someone is giving you constructive criticism, you can recognize it by the fact that they are actually taking their time and effort. They could be doing something else, but they're taking their time and effort to help you improve your costume and uh, realize that they're actually giving you love by doing that. And um, just because you made a mistake somewhere, you know, there are two kinds of states of mind. Now I get really philosophical. Now there is the state of mind where you just want to receive approval. Like, hey, your costume is awesome. Or there is the state of mind where you want to receive a beating up actually, because critique, even constructive, constructive criticism, is kind of a destructive process. It will hurt you a bit, but then you will rebuild stronger. I think that's more what I look for. Yeah. Yeah, so that is good because, um, and honestly, even for me, like, it's not like I'm always going around looking for constructive criticism. Sometimes I'm just going out and I'm like, okay, motherfuckers, give me some love. And uh, that's okay. And that's okay to put it in, uh, put it this way. It's actually even better to let people know. People also have some sort of a, um, what I call it, they feel kind of not allowed to voice their wish for um, confirmation, their, uh, their wish for being loved and accepted and to receive some praise. But that would make uh, things a lot better because uh, if they just put it straight. Because a lot of times what you will see is someone who is just looking for affirmation will go out and go like, hey, I made this costume. And what they expect and what they want and what they hope for is that the other people will say, yes, that's an awesome costume. And what they receive, however, from a well-meaning person is, uh, yeah, but you could really work on that skirt stuff down there. And then they go like, what the fuck? Like, don't you love me? That's what they basically think in that moment. Because they just uh, didn't voice it uh, in a proper way. Like, hey, I made this. I'm proud of this. Give me some love. I don't know. <laughs> That's how it goes. Um, and you, you really need both. So sometimes, uh, so the best advice would be just voice directly what you want. Do you want praise or do you want improvement? Improvement. Yeah, then you need some sort of a decal on the cap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a borrowed cap. Yeah. I also need some sort of a decal on the cap, but that totally was amazing. Totally agree with you. Yeah. All right. Does this help you? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give you my con what my concept is. So I spend a lot of time on my motorcycle oh, wow. and I have a deep connection to it and this kind of drew me to like the late bronze age people of the steppes and kind of the vikings who would move around and raid and so i've tried to think about it and their art is amazing like their bronze work and their iron age work so i kind of wanted to take that as an inspiration and i need to get to everything when i'm writing but i still want to look cool and i want to draw like it's kind of like that we're living in the age after Ragnarok when they said everything would restart because Ragnarok's not the end it's the restarting of a cycle so in my mind I'm like a post-apocalyptic Viking Viking I don't I don't like to use that word because everybody has such but like a post-apocalyptic northern tribes kind of nomad yeah and that's what I'm kind of to where I can still be practical but those people were very concerned with aesthetic because if you're there's no TV there's no radio you're rolling in another group of people sees you and you're on your mount you've got your gear on you're looking a certain way it really it's there's no phone calls that's your first impression that is yeah. your phone call yeah so um, incorporating actual historical and fantasy and other genres into the post-apocalyptic aesthetic and the large post-apocalyptic genre is fortunately for you and everyone else something that you not only can but should do it's what makes uh, things interesting so we as people who make post-apocalyptic costumes and other artworks have the luxury of having a genre that is so widely defined that you could put literally anything into it especially for something like a costumed festival where you're just supposed to come out and have fun in whatever kind of uh, costume you want to have 
So you can incorporate historical Viking stuff. You can think about uh, what would um, something uh, that is like, you know, for example, Torgal, the comics, with the futuristic Viking stuff. Wait, that's not futuristic. That is futuristic Viking stuff. I don't know about it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you could think about uh, what would, would it look like if that Viking culture had developed up to a point of space travel or something and then the civilization came down again what would that look they would probably have you know space suits with runes on them something like that why not there is steampunk there is cyberpunk there is all kinds of punk really that you could use uh, you can draw inspiration from literally anything you can draw inspiration from actual historical stuff like napoleon era clothing worked into a post-apocalyptic costume why not you can do all of that and that is a lot of times what makes your costume look awesome so um go ahead all right yeah and anything critiques like i've been working on this is my first year best and i just kept adding to it yeah so um looks quite basic okay. needs more stuff obviously the decal on the back could really be more uh, what i mentioned before don't just draw it make a cool stencil think about the graphic pronounced. itself yeah more pronounced uh, there is nothing wrong with the quick and dirty painted as aesthetic but uh, another important uh, feature of costumes here because um, here we're on a festival dedicated to cars and costumes and all that people will also judge your costume based on how hard it actually to make something like this and how many other people have something similar so just taking a brush with fabric paint and going over your costume is fairly easy a lot of people can do this. A clean stencil, some people can do that. But st still a lot. It's not something unique. But less people can do a clean stencil that can then can do just a brush stroke. Okay. Uh, and even less people can uh, CNC machine laser out some Viking runes on something that looks like a futuristic spacesuit part, which has been expertly distressed and attached to your other parts, which are also Viking inspired. So there is this aspect for festivals and everything else, or also when you look at costumes on the internet that other people made, like how hard it is, it is to make this. So it's not just how realistic is it, how much does it fit into the genre. It could be something super simple and fitting into the genre and all that, but if it's super simple to make, people will be like, yeah, okay, may, you know. It doesn't make it less legit or you less cool, but it just makes your costume less unique and uh, essentially add more time value yes yes more time value and more skill value both of those grow okay. with time so yeah all right thank you cool so we have 20 more minutes questions yes the white suited traveler of the wastes yeah have you been to the restorationists not yet well, my question is, uh, how do you think they did? Because they're dedicated, they're a church of uh, making people dirty. That's cool. What can I say? It's a really interesting concept. I think it's actually something that should be on every post-apocalyptic event. So, yeah, making people dirty is definitely something that should be happening. Uh, that said, all of this distressing and being dirty and so on and so forth thematic, it's like, in the real apocalypse and also in the fantasy apocalypse and everywhere else you should still kind of be striving for that i'm trying to be clean but can't get it done look rather than just covering yourself completely at all times with all kinds of dirt dirt you can find so not everything needs to be completely distressed and dirt and grungy and so on and so forth that said for beginners get the fuck to the restoration church and get yourself dirty because the most people tend to have um, too little dirt, while some people have too much dirt, but the most tend to have just too little. That's why this church is a thing. So yeah, I think those people are awesome. More questions? No, that's all I got so far. All right, thank you. Woo! Hot as fuck here. Okay, next. Over. Now I'm gonna stand right here so I can look in that direction for a change. Have you ever distressed a vehicle? Nope. Do you want to? Now that you've seen all these. 
Uh, I would want to, yes, but in Germany it's kind of a, a lot more pain in the ass than here and I don't have the space for that myself, so yeah, but um, after Wasteland I'm going to be staying at Eris and Spud's place. Spud is going to teach me how to weld. I can't weld just yet. So yeah, then I'm going to acquire one of the new skills required for that and uh, yeah, why not? Cars are cool. Yeah. Yeah, sure. You next. Yeah. Hi, a uh, little short question um, yeah. about um, when you have an outfit and you wear that more often, yeah. also for like parties or something, and then you sweat, and I don't know, <coughs> it gets dirty. Do you ever have uh, like uh, clean your outfits in, in any way? Because I think at some point it's going to get gross. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> you got that right, my man. Uh, it is, so the way I usually do it nowadays is, again, as what you see here, the shirt can be washed because it's fabric paint. It will stay almost exactly the same way. Uh, the backpack, obviously not, but that's okay. So I usually tend to make it in a way that my bottom layers of clothes that actually touch my body are washable and all the heavier, more decorated stuff that would destroy the washing machine from the inside. I don't wash that. Uh, however, what I do recommend is that every time you take it off, you put it in a way that it can dry. Because it's when it's uh, constantly wet and that's where it gets moldy, that's when it gets disgusting. And when you get home also laid out in the sun, laid out to air dry, so uh, do that kind of stuff. And also don't use organic oils uh, or organic anything on your um, materials at all. Uh, but yeah, it will get dirty eventually. Yeah, no matter what you do, that's yeah. the way things go. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. Mike. Yeah, let me stand here so I can get those guys and girls. My question is, how do you find a balance between what looks cool and what's comfortable? Because uh, I have a problem with, like, I find stuff that I like, uh, like bullets, for instance. But um, I don't like the way that the fake bullets look, like I can spot it a mile away. But I'm not uh, crafty enough to create a fake-looking bullet, so I just end up using the real stuff, and it ends up being really uncomfortable after a while. <laughs> Yeah, what can I say? You're Mike Kamling, you're known for this, for the bullet thing, and uh, I think it's awesome. And that is actually uh, what I mentioned before, how hard it is, is it to pull this off aspect, which is why I liked your works the moment I saw them, because I was, especially when you told me how much it weighs, because I also know that fake bullets look like shit most of the time. And uh, since you're going the extra mile and wearing those, that is the additional awesomeness. Um, you could, I guess, ask Elliot when he's around how he does this kind of stuff. Maybe there is some really good painting technique. What I would recommend is, like, if you want to try making fake bullets, there are, uh, are those chrome sprays. I don't remember the brand right now. Again, I, I also need to ask Elliot myself. And Anthony uh, seen it uh, recently, used it recently. It makes a really cool metallic effect. So uh, I could actually make a tutorial about making uh, fake metal, if you want, when I get back to Germany. So uh, that is something I wanted to make for a while now, so that might actually be an interesting topic. Uh, there are ways to make it look almost as good as the real thing, but yeah, uh, in my opinion, nothing feels as good as the real thing. Like when you touch it and you know it's real metal, that's awesome. That's why I really like making armors out of real metal and adding metal parts to the costumes that I make. Um, so there is no simple answer to that. But there are, I can tell you, there are a lot of techniques of making lightweight stuff look really cool and realistic. They do it for movies all the time. But it will never feel on. that way. Cool. I yeah. got a critique. Oh, it is? Huh? Critique. I can turn on the app. Yeah. Uh, I would say uh, your costume is one of the classic Wasteland Weekend costumes. Not a lot of crit critique I could really do there. Uh, maybe more dirt on the pants, like just more distressing effects. And other than that, um, as I've said before, like I could start going around like, oh, this is too shiny, that is too shiny, but that's all detail. Um, what you could do for surface detail is like um, acrylic paint, slap it on, wipe it off, and then it will uh, remain in the nooks and crannies. That will look a bit cooler. Um, but otherwise, I really honestly, you have a distinct style. I don't want to fuck with it. It's great. Yeah.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, next, 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 next. Who's next? Kai. Cool. Hey, dude. So, um, great uh, costume, by the way. Thank you. So, I do a lot of LARP, like you do. Yeah. Um, and, like, I'm wearing some of my LARPing stuff from Dystopia Rising right now, which is uh, the post apocalyptic LARP in the US. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, uh, I was wondering, kind of, as a LARPer to a LARPer, what uh, what was uh, your favorite LARPing costume and why? Like, when you're making a post-apocalyptic LARP, like LARP gear particularly, what kind of decisions do you make that might be different to like Wastelander gear, maybe? Uh, for me, there is no difference really because uh, I strive, especially if it's uh, my personal costumes and not something that a client requested with specific specifications for them. For my personal gear, my goal is always to make it uh, in such a way that it's comfortable, that it's safe and uh, cool looking at the same time. So I really don't differentiate between uh, Wasteland Weekend or Dystopia Rising or whatever other LARP I might go to. The costume just has to be high standard. That is also something that I do for clients uh, by default as well. I try to make it as comfortable and unbreakable as possible unless they have other priorities specifically. But otherwise, it's just, uh, you know, it's always just the setting that it's in. It might be 200 years after the nuclear war apocalyptic, or it might be the alien apocalypse in a more futuristic and modern looking setting. Whatever it may be, I'll just make the most comfortable and badass looking and safe gear in that direction as much as I can for whatever application and go with that. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, Thank you. Would you be willing to critique just the vest? I'm not wearing the rest of it right now. But. Yeah, so just as with Mike, it's a very unique thing. It's one of those costumes that I uh, actually remember. And it's, uh, yeah, you said it's based on a rockabilly style. Yeah. I can see that. Mm -hmm. That is pretty cool. This is actually the flagship costume for this kind of wasteland style, I would say. Because I see a lot of people trying to do that and uh, going in that direction just not as good and uh, I, I really really like it because um, it is also really really distinct from the most gear that I've seen so far and that is actually what you want to do at some point you want to go uh, in a direction which makes your custom more di distinct and memorable yeah thank you yeah okay we have 10 more minutes <laughs> More questions, please. Hey, I'm just a... Uh... Hey there, Nicholas Neal. Glad to, glad to see you here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a first year. It's my first time here. Welcome. Um, first time any making any costume kind of of this sort. Yeah. Um, so I, my main goal was just, just scavenged. That's really kind of my thing here. I had a, a limited amount of time and a little amount of equipment, but um, if you just have okay. a few thoughts, cool. I'd uh, really appreciate that. Welcome. You know, critiques are good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it looks exactly like what you said. You just started out. It is a base. But it needs a fuckload of more decoration, if you ask me. If you're going for that uh, typical wasteland, de highly decorated, pimp-looking costume, sure. then it needs more detail, obviously. Let's see this? Yeah. I mean, so far so good. It uh, it looks like a base. Uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of points where where the connections aren't or the transitions aren't really clean, such as, for example, here take this away but um, you know there is also this certain thing that I usually do all of my costumes look really streamlined in some ways like this here is a good example like I would for example never leave an edge like this so it just goes in quotation marks in an ugly way just straight down I would tuck it away so it flows naturally and stuff like that sure, it's yeah. something you can do it's something you don't have to do like a lot of people think they have to do it exactly like I do, it's not the case. You could also go for like more chaos instead of less. Yeah. The good thing that is going on here is that you have those two solid plates right here and onto those you can easily mount a lot of practical stuff, decorations, like a drinking bladder, whatever you want. So uh, for now just continue with it and do more. That's all there is to it. It's a good start. All right. Next. You, you mentioned earlier with your relationship in post-apocalyptic pirate. You're like a pirate deal? Nice! <laughs> yeah, that's a pirate. You'll see the rest of it at the Codpiece Contest. Cool. So you have we, a... We, a we, you and I talked about the Codpiece Contest. You have a post-apocalyptic pirate Codpiece. <laughs> well, yeah. Fuck yeah. Is it like a literal cod? 
I, I don't want to give too many secrets. All right. <laughs> okay. Have you heard of anyone talking about a squirrel and a copies in the same sentence since you've been here? I don't know. Okay. There's a squirrel involved. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now I'm imagining like an entire car being your cut piece and a squirrel uh, duct tape to the to a tire as a roadkill. But yeah, but anyway, you know, this code is also coming up with, you know, check it out. Give me your opinion. Cool. Crucify yeah. What? <laughs> Say crucify it if you must, but yeah. It's well, it's also, I mean, depending on how much detail you want to have, it could take a lot more detail could, if yeah. you want. I just made it. It's made. It's actually a Harbor Freight drop cloth. Made nice. into a coat. Yeah. And then you know all that. You know that's all. It's all metal. Yeah, that's cool. But uh, I mean, if you wanna continue working on it and adding more yeah. detail, there is a we'll lot add, more to add yeah, so everywhere. Add, like some like gaudy like like you know metals. Here. Yeah, and also where where is the parrot? Like a mechanical parrot. That would be a good idea. Yeah. I could I could do that. That would fuck with your hat, by the way, because it will get in the way. Yeah. But maybe it can sit on the I, hat, I, I don't know. Do like, yeah, I could do a shoulder squirrel. Yeah, or a shoulder squirrel. <laughs> uh, basically, same as with this guy, you just yeah. continue and uh, add more. It's a good yeah, start. There's more to it. You're, it's, it's, but you're fucking hot right now. you've done the most important step. Awesome. You have your basic concept, and you can add on to that. Yeah. A lot of people struggle with this initial step. You have to have it behind you for this costume. Yeah. So just continue. Yeah. All right. More, more, more. Luciano. All right. Now, this looks cool. This is a copper buckle. This is Koppeltragestell, and this is nuclear snail inspired as fuck. That's cool. Um, now you asked asked for some shit. Now. All in all, it looks uh, really decent. It is a nice composition. It is practical as well. Especially, I really like the back work. That's gorgeous. Like, this doesn't get any better. Really. Yeah, this is also great. This is great. This is great. So, uh, the back work is awesome. These custom side plates are good. Like, the parts I like the most are actually the ones that uh, are not something that I've did uh, made so far. That is something a bit new, such as the leather pouches. Um, I do like the knife. Um, the black short, it works. But it's one of those things that it's like, it's a black short. Yeah, but I kind of... It, it works with the theme, yeah. Uh, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like usually, I would say, uh, okay, ditch the black shirt. But in this case, it works because um, you know, at some point, at least for me, it's like, yeah, it's black. A black shirt is typical for beginner, blah blah blah. But the rest is great, okay. so it looks cool. Uh, what I would advise you is on a way higher level than to everyone uh, uh, or to the average wastelander. Like, you are already an advanced crafter, so what you might want to try for the next piece is something that is not nuclear snail inspired. As much as I love it, at some point, every crafter reaches the point where uh, they uh, get to discover their own style or at least sub style, and you're at that point already. You're one of the better crafters I know, so just go there and find out what uh, you could create as your own style. You're just that far. It's like a black belt, so go kick some ass. Thanks, man. Yeah. Five minutes. All right. I want a little bit of critique because I'm mixing and matching, but that's not probably not going to work. So it's either minimal rust or no rust or all rust. Uh, minimal rust, no rust, or all rust. Um, whatever you want really but uh, I would not go with no rust like this whole thing about the Church of Restoration dirting people up and this common more dirt uh, thing comes again from the authenticity factor so while it might be realistic as I said before people would be trying to be clean and maybe you are in a settlement that has clean clothes and all that it's possible but you still want to make your costume look more out of this world and by this world, I mean like the world outside of Wasteland. And outside of Wasteland, stuff is clean. And uh, making it dirty is just one of the fastest basic shortcuts in, uh, for saying like, hey, this is actually a costume. This is actually supposed to be immersive. 
So I would go with definitely a lot more than you have right now. A lot more than you have right now. Yeah. Growing it. Yeah, keep growing it, keep adding uh, everything, including dirt. Um, it is really hard to go overboard. Like, as I said, there are a lot more people with too little dirt than there are people with too much dirt, and you have definitely too little. All right. I will see you next year with more dirt. <laughs> War boy. Quick question. Yeah. Sunglasses. We need sunglasses. Obviously, we need sunglasses to work. What advice have you got for distressing sunglasses and making sunglasses look part of a costume rather than added onto it? Yeah. Well, first of all, you might want to wear goggles, such as you're doing right now, or such as he is doing. Also, Mike. Uh, Luciano, the glasses, by the way, look way too much. Yeah, don't, don't do what Luciano does regarding glasses. <laughs> In high situation it works because those uh, sunglasses just go with the rest of his costume which has a lot of chrome, so that's cool. Um, advice for distressing them, basically like distressing anything, uh, scratching and paint. Uh, you, I don't know how far you want to go like um, on distressing the glass itself. My friend Joe actually did that to his sunglasses, uh, obviously it fucks with their vision. So there is no beautiful solution to that. Uh, depending on what kind of goggles you have, you might want to dust them up and then rub it off in the middle so it looks like you just came out of Wasteland. So basically just use adhesive agents like um, glue spray to make things stick better to your uh, stuff, to make dust stick better to your costume and uh, prop parts. So. Yeah, but everything else, like people ask all the time, how to distress this, how to distress that, and they will always be very specific. Like, how to, dis to distress, like, this year's brand of that exact gas mask. Like, I have a freaking catalog of how to distress any sort of giving shit at any time. I don't. <laughs> you just take some dirt, you just take some paint, and you, you know, you rub it. There is just two factors, mechanical uh, abrasion, scratching, rubbing, sand sanding, and there is a... Uh, Paint, yeah, and dust. So that's it. That's what you do. Thank and you. also, of course, adding parts on top of it, decals, all of that. Sure. Thank you. Even. So that. So negative space in design. We're both designers. What's your? What can you tell everybody else that they don't already know about negative space in a costume and why is it so important? Negative space in a costume. One hell of a topic to start one minute away from. Uh, and. Watch my detail areas and rest areas video on YouTube. That is negative space. And on that note, we're out of time. Uh, thanks for coming. If you have more questions and if you want to participate more, there will pro probably be other questions from everyone else on the, um, tomorrow's workshop, which is going to be at 13.30 tomorrow. So everyone is welcome to come by again if you want. And uh, yeah. Thank you, and I will see you around. That's it. That's the end. You made it through. So now I know you definitely want to be subscribed. So click that button, leave a thumbs up, and check out Nuclear Snail, and I'll see you guys next time. Stay alive.